1993, Texas police were called out to one of the most gruesome crime scenes they had ever seen. But little did they know that their killer had been reigning terror right under their noses for years and no one had any idea. <laughs> So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to be talking about the Texas teen murders. But before we get into it, I do just want to thank our sponsor for making this video possible, NordVPN. I refuse to use the internet without a VPN these days, and I think everyone should, I think you should, and my VPN of choice has been NordVPN for years now. Basically, a VPN kind of acts as a barrier to stop people from hacking you or accessing your private information online. So how it works, you go onto the NordVPN map and you can choose from up to 60 different countries and the VPN will make it seem as though you're operating from a different IP address within that other country. And this comes with a million and one other benefits other than just internet safety. For example, the biggest benefit that I use a VPN for is the streaming services. You can access any of those 60 countries streaming platforms and their selections on those platforms. I only ever use American Netflix, really. Actually, I use Turkish Netflix sometimes these days because they've got all the Harry Potter movies. All of them. Wait, is it all of them? I actually don't know, but they've got a lot of them. They've got the Harry Potter movies, guys. But I've been using a VPN to get on American Netflix probably since 2018. It also means that if you're traveling, you can stay up to date with your favorite shows. So you can kind of bring your shows along with you on holiday just set your VPN to back home and you'll be able to watch whatever you were watching before. NordVPN is super quick and easy to use. You can connect literally within seconds and it is the fastest VPN provider. They've all been tested and NordVPN is the fastest. And NordVPN have an exclusive deal for you guys when you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor. It is risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Now, before we get into it, I do just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. There are some rather big content warnings in this video. This case does involve the murder of children, it involves paedophilia, the murder and abuse of animals. That is a running theme throughout the video. We're also going to be talking about mutilation and child abuse and neglect. So if any of that is something that you feel like you can't listen to right now, I completely understand. Click out of this video and look after yourself and hopefully I'll get to see you again at some other point. But that being said, let's get into the case. So today's case takes place in Texas, Ellis County in Texas in summer of 1993. On July 29th, a group of road workers walked into a wooded area. I think they were like surveying it or something. It was a very hot day that day. It was 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 38 Celsius. And as they made their way deeper and deeper into this woods, one of the workers noticed something laying on the ground under a load of leaves and branches. And so the group walked over to go and have a look what this thing was and as they got closer they were able to make out that this was a human body a dead human body that was severely mutilated it seemed as though it could have been the body of a young girl although they didn't actually know that because the body was entirely decapitated she didn't have a head. She was found completely naked and exposed and her genitals were mutilated beyond belief. Her nipples were cut off and so were both of her hands. So all that was left of this body was the torso and legs, but even then all of that was severely mutilated. There was a huge slash all the way across her stomach and her internal organs were coming out. So the workers immediately called the police who rushed straight down to the scene and cordoned off that whole wooded area to begin an investigation into how this poor girl was killed in this way. But as they were doing that, as they were like putting up all the police tape in the woods, they found another body, a second dead body. This time it was a young boy. His body was found underneath a bridge and it was in very different circumstances to the other body that they'd found. For example, this boy was fully clothed when they found him. He wasn't mutilated in any kind of way. In fact, they could tell that the only injuries he had were two gunshot wounds to his head. So police searched the pockets of this young boy and they found his wallet, which actually had a library card in it that had his name, Brian King. So they'd very quickly managed to identify one of the victims, although they knew trying to identify the female victim was gonna be such a challenge because they didn't have her head 
or her hands. It seemed that the killer had gone to extra lengths to try to hide this girl's identity when they'd killed her. You know, getting rid of her fingerprints, getting rid of her dental records. And it struck police as quite odd that they'd gone to such lengths with one victim and not with the other. Does that mean the same person had done both murders or was it different people? So anyway, while searches and forensic tests and everything were being done at the crime scene, other police officers went to go and break the tragic news to Brian King's family that they'd found his dead body. It turned out that Brian was only 14 years old when he was killed. He was a child. I mean, police had thought he was young. They thought he was like an older teenager. They had no idea that he was a kid. So they spoke with Brian's father and his stepmother and they told them the whole situation that another body had been found as well, a, a female body alongside Brian's. And that was when his parents' hearts sunk even further because Brian had a 13 year old stepsister who was currently missing. Both of them had been missing for a good few days before this discovery was made. Their parents had reported both Brian and his younger sister as missing to the police three days before this. His stepsister's name was Christina Benjamin. And like I said, she was just 13 years old. They were 13 and 14. They were kids, two kids murdered, mutilated and left out in the woods. So now police knew that they had to do everything in their power to solve these murder cases for these heartbroken parents. So they sat and spoke with them. They wanted to get as much information as they could about Brian, Christina, their lives, their routines. And they wanted to know a lot about the day that they went missing, which was three days before this. Brian's parents said the last time that they'd seen him, he was laying out in a hammock in the backyard and it was quite late. It was like 10, 11, going upon 12 o'clock. He was out there for a while. And this was on the evening of the 26th. The bodies were found on the 29th. Around midnight that night, Brian's father heard a car horn outside their house. And so he walked over to the window to have a look who was out there. And he couldn't really make out who was in the car. It was someone in a car. And then he saw his son, Brian, running from the backyard and jumping into the car with this person. As soon as Brian jumped inside, actually, I think he stood outside talking to the person inside for like, 20 seconds and then he jumped in and the car drove away and then the parents hadn't seen Brian or Christina since then. I think at the time the dad assumed that it must have been one of Brian's friends in the car or something even though he was quite young I don't think any of his friends would have been able to drive. I don't know the father didn't think much of it for some reason and then the next morning they woke up and neither Brian nor Christina were in their beds. Immediately that morning when they realized that both the kids were gone, the parents realized that something very bad had happened. There was no reasonable explanation as to why both children would be missing from their beds the following morning. They knew that something had happened to those kids and so straight away the parents reported them missing. So now police had officially identified both murder victims. It was Brian King and Christina Benjamin. Meanwhile, back at the crime scene, the forensic tests and searches and all of that kind of stuff was revealing some very valuable evidence. A lot of hair was collected from the crime scene. A lot of long blonde hairs that belonged to Christina. They were tested and they were Christina's, but there were a few shorter blonde hairs that weren't a match to anyone. They weren't Brian's, they weren't Christina's, they didn't know whose they were. And this told police that there must have been quite a big struggle as part of this attack. Christina had lost a lot of hair in this altercation, probably being pulled out, and so had her attacker. I mean, not as much as Christina, but there were a few shorter blonde hairs, and if they were her attackers, then... So police decided to put those in a little evidence bag and keep them. So if you remember, Brian King was found fully clothed and so they took all of his clothes as evidence and they went and tested them and they found, they found the tiniest, one singular, tiny, tiny, tiny brown fiber on the front of his shoe. They literally could have so easily missed this fiber. Apparently it was minuscule, tiny little thing. And it didn't match any of the other fibers that they'd been finding on him. And so they decided to like pull this one out and test it, see what it could be. And when the test came back, I don't know how they get this so accurate, but they believed that it could be from a Japanese car. It's amazing how they can tell these things, but that fiber told police that he had been in a car which confirmed his parents' version of events, had the person in that car that came to pick him up killed him 
and his sister. So police felt the best course of action in this case was to try and track down that car, find out who was driving it, find out who they were going out with that night. So police went out and did door-to-door -door inquiries on Brian and Christina's street to see if anyone had seen or heard anything and no one had really seen anything that night. There were no witnesses from that night, but they did find out some interesting information from one of the neighbors who said that he'd actually been speaking to Brian and Christina earlier in the day that they went missing. And they very briefly mentioned in conversation that they were planning on going out that night with a guy called Jason. And that's all they really said about it. So now police had a name, who was Jason? I mean, it's quite a vague lead. There's a lot of Jasons in the world. They had no idea how to narrow down the Jasons, but they were trying. But then two days later, police received an anonymous phone call with some very valuable information. The person on the phone didn't want to give over their identity, but they wanted to tell police that they should look into a guy called Jason Massey. And immediately police's ears perked up because they knew that they were looking for a Jason. No one else did. They hadn't put this out in the media yet. And this other anonymous caller was bringing them more Jason information. Now they have a surname of a potential suspect, Jason Massey. Who is Jason Massey? Jason Eric Massey was 21 years old at the time of this case, born on January 7th, 1973 in Ellis County, Texas. So he'd stayed in his hometown all his life. He was born to a very young single mother who had a lot of struggles of her own. She was in major poverty and of course, so was her child now. She struggled with substance abuse issues, abusive relationships in her life. The family were constantly moving around because they were always getting evicted from every apartment that they rented because they never paid their rent because they couldn't afford it. So they were constantly moving around or homeless or staying in shelters. And like I said, the mother had abusive boyfriends who would come round to the house and abuse her child as well. I don't think the mother ever abused Jason, but she wasn't a good mother either. Don't get me wrong. She was very neglectful. She used to leave Jason in the car and go out into the bars and drink and get drunk for hours. So a very unhappy childhood from a lot of angles. And there were a lot of warning signs actually in Jason Massey's life, in his childhood, that things were going wrong. You know, he started to hurt other children when he was just nine years old, like sadistically hurting children, not just getting into fights. He was like pinning kids down and whipping them with tree branches, like horrible stuff. And shortly after the abuse of his peers began, abusing his friends, he also started to abuse animals. In fact, when he was around 10, 11 years old, he killed his first cat. He actually strangled and then mutilated this cat, decapitated it, and this would be the first of many. We'll get more into that further on in the case, but that was a big thing in his life was killing animals. He got a real satisfaction out of it. There was another red flag in Jason's childhood. One day, one of his teachers noted that he'd brought a Charles Manson book into school when he was like 13. Charles Manson, the cult leader, serial killer. It's obviously not a very appropriate book for a child. And so this teacher approached Jason about it and she shared her concerns, but he got very defensive and he was expressing a lot of passion about this particular topic. He even said that Ted Bundy was his hero. The teacher was very taken aback by this. That really was not the response that she was expecting. And so a couple of days later, she tried to get in touch with Jason's mother to report this incident, report that he is saying these kind of things, but she couldn't get in contact with his mother because the family had moved again. Wherever he moved to next, he actually got caught by police stalking a woman. And so the family had to move again very quickly. So at this point in the case, Jason is around 18 years old. And one particular day, his mother went into his room while he was at school or whatever. And she was just tidying his room for him when she stumbled across his diaries three years worth of journals. So she picked them up and she starts flicking through them, reading different passages. And that was when she realized the amount of horrifying material in her son's journals. For example, she found a kill list, a list of a bunch of girls' names. And he'd said alongside it that he had a desire to become a serial killer. And these were all his 
targets. I have a couple of little quotes. He said that it was time to embark on this sacred journey, I presume to become a serial killer, and that he wanted to engrave his name in society. So his mother's reading these diaries and as neglectful as she had been all the way through Jason's life, she'd never been a great mother to him. In this moment, she knew that he needed help. She thought he was mentally ill and she was scared. She was scared not only for her son, but also for everyone else around him. So immediately his mother booked him in for a psychiatric assessment. And at the end of this session, the psychiatrist concluded that Jason Massey was a threat to society and needed to be sent to a psychiatric hospital then and there. So the same day he was sent to a hospital. However, he wasn't in there very long because after a few days, maybe about a week, he had a second assessment and this second psychiatrist completely disagreed with everything the first one said. I don't know how that, I don't know how that even happens. The second psychiatrist couldn't believe that Jason had been sent to this hospital because he was nowhere near, you know, ill enough to be in that situation. Or at least that's what the second psychiatrist thought. Um, and so after that, he was released from from the psychiatric unit. I find it very interesting that it only takes one assessment to get sent there or one assessment to get sent out because clearly they're all disagreeing so maybe it should take a second opinion. I actually, I don't know how the assessments can be so different from like a week apart unless Jason was trying to do that, I don't know. Either way, that was just a little bit of information about Jason Massey, but remember where we were in the timeline of this case, an anonymous caller has just called the police giving over Jason Massey's name as a potential suspect. So police asked this anonymous caller, you know, why? Why, why do you think it's Jason Massey? What reason do you have to think that he's a murderer? And this person on the phone said that Jason has quite a reputation in that town, a reputation for being a killer. He'd never killed any humans, as far as people were aware at this point in time, but he was known for killing cats, dogs, people's pets, just stealing them, murdering them in the most brutal way as well. He would like behead these animals. The anonymous caller also gave like loads of other weird aspects of his personality. Like for example, he would make jokes about murder a lot and like murdering young girls. That seemed to be like a running theme of his jokes. And it creeped people out. It always creeped people out, but not enough for them to report it until now, obviously. So police had a bit more of a talk with this anonymous caller. They tried to get as much information about Jason Massey as they possibly could. And this caller actually gave over a few names of Jason's friends. So the police went and spoke to all of these friends and they all confirmed the stories that the anonymous caller had told them. They said that, yeah, Jason did kill animals. He did joke about murdering girls. But they actually had even more to tell police and it gets even worse. So all of these dogs and cats that he would kill and decapitate, he would keep those heads in a box in his house. Rotting heads, a lot of them were just skulls at this point. One of these friends actually told the police that in the days prior to the murders, they remembered Jason Massey talking about Brian and Christina, even specifically saying that he wanted to get Christina alone. And this was all police needed to hear. And within a few hours of these questionings, police were at Jason Massey's house, arresting him on suspicion of murder. So he was brought to the police station for a questioning and immediately he was presented with the crime scene photos to try and get some sort of reaction from him. And it worked. As soon as he saw the picture of Christina's mutilated body, remember her organs were literally coming out of her, he started to gag. He was acting repulsed and horrified by this picture. He was pushing it away. He didn't want to see it. He was saying how awful it is that that's happened to that girl. And like, he had nothing to do with it and he feels so bad for them. He was just so disgusted that someone could do that to an innocent child. Police really thought he was just acting though. Like they thought he was just putting this on to seem like he was on their side. So they knew it wasn't going to be very easy to get any information out of Jason since he's acting and pretending the whole time. They were gonna have to try and find supporting evidence elsewhere. They weren't gonna get a confession. And that was when they thought back to that one 
singular tiny little fiber that was found on Brian's shoe, the one that's still not been identified, they still had no idea where it came from, although they did believe that it was from a Japanese car, remember? So police did a little bit of digging and they found out that Jason Massey drove a Subaru, a Japanese car. And so they went and got a search warrant like ASAP. The first thing they did when they got this search warrant, they went straight to the front footwell, ripped out the carpet and sent it off to the lab for testing against that fiber to see if the fiber was from the car. The next place they looked in the car was the boot, the trunk of the car. And as soon as they opened the boot, it was like case closed. In there was a hammer, duct tape, and a Walmart receipt for a purchase of handcuffs, a hunting knife, and bullets. There was no gun in the car, even though we know that that was the murder weapon, at least in Brian's case, it was the murder weapon. But really with all the other evidence that they had there, they didn't really need it. They wanted it, but the duct tape, the hammer, essentially a murder kit in the boot of his car was enough evidence, I think. So police went down to that Walmart that this receipt came from and they wanted to speak to the employee that had served Jason that day and luckily she was in. They showed her a picture of Jason Massey and she confirmed that that was the guy that she served. And actually she thought it was quite interesting because she didn't even know that they sold handcuffs at that store. I suppose that tells you how often people buy handcuffs from Walmart. He was the first person that she'd ever sold them to. The first person that had ever wanted to. I don't know, I'm very surprised that she checked him out with a hunting knife, handcuffs and bullets. Very suspicious trio. Anyway, as all this was going on at Walmart, police officers back at the station actually got another anonymous phone call, giving over even more information about Jason Massey. This time, an anonymous caller was saying that he'd seen Jason at a car wash the day after the murders. He had taken his car to get a full inside and outside valet clean. Suspicious enough, isn't it? And so police went straight down to that car wash that he'd been seen at, and luckily, they actually hadn't thrown away the contents of the vacuum that they'd used to clean his car. And so they let police take all the dirt from inside the vacuum to take to the lab and test. I can't imagine how tedious of a job that would be. You're literally looking through just a big mound of fibers and they've got to test every single one. And they did it. They, they really put in the work here and they found something. Well, lots of things actually. A lot of Christina's hairs. Christina's hair was all over his car before it was clean, which says that she was in there probably on the night that she was killed. By now as well, tests were coming back on those hairs that were found at the crime scene. There were loads of long blonde ones that were Christina's, but the shorter blonde ones hadn't been identified. But now they had Jason Massey's DNA, they could test it against that and it was a match. His hair was at the murder scene. Not only that, but we've got a hat trick of evidence because the tests on that fiber came back and yes, the fiber did match to Jason Massey's car. So Brian had also been in the car that night. And with that, absolutely no more evidence was needed and Jason Massey was charged with the murders of Brian King and Christina Benjamin. Because Jason still wasn't admitting guilt at this point, when it came to the trial, police didn't know exactly what happened. Obviously the only person that does is Jason. And if he's not willing to tell it, then police had to come up with a theorized version of events. Based on all of the physical evidence that they had, this is the sequence of events that they think probably happened. So it seemed very clear from speaking to all the different witnesses and stuff that the three of them, Jason and Brian and Christina, seem to have planned in advance to meet up that night. This was a a plan. It's unknown what the plan was, like what they were gonna do that night. A lot of people think they were just gonna drive around because I mean, Christina was 13. What is she gonna do in the middle of the night? But anyway, they made this plan. Jason drove to their house, honked his horn and waited for them to come and get in the car. Well, actually there's differing possibilities here because remember the father only saw Brian getting into the car and then the car drove away. So police actually think that Christina was already in the car at that point in time. They think that Christina and Jason had been together for a little while before they picked up Brian. So anyway, now they've picked up Brian, the three of them drive around for a little while until Jason pulls them into a secluded area. And then his whole demeanor changes. It's believed that he pulled out a gun without any warning, immediately aimed it at Brian's head and shot him twice at close range, right in the face. Police believe that the only reason Brian was killed was simply just to get him out of the way 
so that Jason could turn all of his attentions to his younger sister, Christina. Obviously, Jason didn't want Brian there to witness this or to try and get help or to snitch on him in any way. So it was just easier for him to kill Brian and then turn his attention to Christina. Police think that as soon as Jason shot Brian, this obviously terrified Christina and she tried to escape. She jumped out of the car and started running. So Jason jumped out of the car and starts chasing after her, but she's too fast for him. He can't catch up to her. She's getting further and further away. So the only other option he had was to get out his gun and shoot her twice in the back. In the space of less than a minute, he had just shot both these siblings to death for no reason, for with no explanation. Jason went back to his car grabbed his new hunting knife that he bought from Walmart a couple of days prior, and then he approached Christina's body. He then proceeded to mutilate this poor girl, decapitate her, chopped her hands off, chopped her nipples off. He then slashed all the way across her torso and physically pulled out her insides. So they were spilling out of her. He also severely mutilated her genitals. And so for that reason, actually, we don't know for sure if she was sexually assaulted. It seems that that was his intention. The one thing that really got police and anyone that's looked at this case is the lack of a motive. There was absolutely no reason for him to want to do this other than well, that he wanted to do this. It seemed like he was killing for pleasure. He'd talked about it for years before. He'd been killing animals for years before and maybe that just wasn't fun enough anymore. He wanted a human victim now. A lot of people think that he was sexually attracted to 13 year old Christina and that was why he wanted to get her alone away from Brian so that he could sexually assault her. But when she tried to escape, it was easier to just kill her so that she wouldn't get away and tell the police. So that was police's theorized version of events. And then they went on to present their piles and piles and piles of evidence to the court, including that box of animal heads. Because on a search of Jason Massey's house, they found it. They found this box. By now, they were pretty much all skulls. There were 31, 31 heads in a box. His journals were also presented as evidence in court. One of them he'd actually titled The Slayer Book of Death. And in this journal, he kept count of all the animals that he had killed. In total, there was nine cats, 30 dogs, three zero dogs, and eight cows. He also said in another journal that he hoped to become the most famous serial killer in America one day, and that he was aiming for a kill count of 700. So anyway, that was, that was all his diary entries. And then in the trial came the witness testimonies. So the prosecution brought up a few different people, starting with Jason's friend, Christopher. And Christopher is actually the person that introduced Jason and Christina. So the way that Jason and Christina had met, Jason was with his friend Christopher that night and he was going to see Christina for some reason, don't know why, and he took Jason along with him. And as soon as Jason saw, 21 year old Jason saw this 13 year old girl, he was taken with her, he, he liked her. He flirted with her all night that they were there and then before he left, he told her that he wanted to see her again sometime and apparently she wanted to see him too. And so they made a plan to meet up again the following week the night of the murder. And she was gonna sneak out of her house, come and meet him, they were gonna go out together. But on the night that Jason met Christina, this friend Christopher said that when they left, all Jason could talk about was how much he wanted to kill Christina and chop her up. What, your friend was saying that to you and you're not going to the police? Apparently like that was all he was talking about on the drive home, that he wanted to murder and chop up this 13 year old, your 13 year old friend that you just introduced. Sorry, I'm getting heated. I actually cannot, I cannot, I can't believe it. But the reason this friend said that he didn't tell the police or anything was because Jason said that kind of stuff a lot. What, is that not all the more reason to tell the police if this is a common theme in his life? Not just like a one-off dark joke. This is something he's talking about all the time, murdering and chopping up young girls and oh, that's just Jason. What? Literally dumbfounded at that. I, I was, oh my God. Like this is a guy that's known for murdering animals as well. Lots of them, over 30, over 40. And now he's talking about wanting to do it to humans and everyone's just like, oh, okay. Anyway, that was the first of the witness testimonies. The second one was a girl that Jason went to school with. She said that Jason, when he was in school, he was 
horrible. He would harass her and all the other girls. He would sexually objectify them, you know. He would manage to get hold of their personal phone numbers and then call them like in the evenings and even threaten them sometimes. This girl that was doing the witness testimony, her name was Anita and she seemed to be kind of the main target of his harassment when they were in school. She was the one that he would always go for. He used to tell Anita that he had dreams about murdering her. And one time he actually cut out a model from a magazine and then cut the head off the model and sent it to Anita with a little note that said, this is what you're gonna look like soon. But the worst that it got for Anita was when Jason asked her out on a date one time and she rejected him. She said she didn't wanna go on this date. The next morning, she woke up, looked out of her bedroom window and on her driveway, Jason had murdered her family dog, murdered her dog and then spread its blood all over Anita's car. I really cannot believe it took so long for this guy to get some prison time, but finally, at the end of this trial, of course, he was found guilty of both of the murders. And for the double murder of two children, Jason Massey was sentenced to death. He was to be executed on April 3rd, 2001. Before his death date, Jason requested to speak to the parents of his murder victims. He wanted to speak to Brian and Christina's parents. And they were very reluctant to do so, but they ended up accepting anyway. They went down there and finally, this is the first time Jason confessed to both murders. He'd been denying it the whole time. Finally now, face to face with their parents, he confessed that he killed those kids. And he was, he seemed remorseful. I don't know if it's genuine remorse or fake, but he seemed remorseful. He was apologizing. He was trying to comfort them weirdly. He told them that Christina hadn't actually suffered as bad as you might think, you know, because she was shot first. He didn't do all the mutilation when she was alive and that's supposed to give her parents some kind of comfort. He also told them that when she died, he actually saw three angels float out of Christina's body. And finally, before he left this meeting and went back to his prison cell forever, he told her parents where they could find Christina's head and her hands in the Trinity River. So divers were sent into the Trinity River to see if they could find any of her remains but nothing else was ever found of Christina, unfortunately. Very quickly, April 3rd of 2001 rolled round. It was Jason Massey's death date and his final meal on death row was quite something. He had three fried chickens, three lots of corn on the cob, fried squash, fried eggplant, mashed potatoes, a load of vegetables, and then to finish, he had a pint of caramel pecan fudge ice cream and a pitcher of sweet tea. Oh, yeah. And his very last words before he was executed by the lethal injection were, tonight I dance on the streets of gold. Let those without sin cast the first stone. And that is all I have on this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Remember, they've got an exclusive deal for you guys right now when you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor. It's risk-free as well with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? A huge, huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting me and helping decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now right now. If you want to become a channel member, you can click the link to do so in the description or you can click the join button if you're on a desktop. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up on this video. I would really appreciate it. And if you did enjoy, you might also enjoy this video. I'll pick you a new one out. Or if you want to subscribe to my channel, you can click this little circle. I post videos like this all the time. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>